Library. Welcome to tonight's feature event with Catherine Grace Katz, author of Daughters of Yalta, The Churchills, Roosevelt's, and Harriman's, A Story of Family, Love, and War. We're delighted to have you join us from near and far. Before we begin, a few details about tonight's program, uh, about how it will proceed. Our author, K Catherine Grace Katz, will speak first, followed by a Q&A led by librarians Amy Barrow and Barbara Goodman. We're using Zoom webinar for tonight's event, and that means that as an attendee, you can see and hear us, the panelists, but we can't see or hear you, the attendees. If you have a question for Catherine, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. The icon looks like two overlapping conversation bubbles. Amy and Barb will get to as many of those questions as time permits after Catherine's talk. If you haven't yet read Daughters of Yalta, contact Wilmette Public Library or your own local library to borrow a copy. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, please support the Bookstall, our local independent bookstore. You can locate the Bookstall's contact information by visiting the library's webpage about tonight's event. And a quick note about our future programming. We'd like to invite you to join us for this year's com community reading series, One Book Everyone Reads. We'll be exploring Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu, the winner of the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction, complete with supplemental programming for all ages and sponsored by the Friends of the Wilmette Public Library. Mr. Yu will join us via Zoom on Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. to talk about his book. Stay tuned for more details about this series in the coming weeks. Now, I'm pleased to welcome author Catherine Grace Katz. You may already know that Catherine grew up in neighboring Winnetka and graduated from New Trier High School in 2009. I understand that she spent time at Wilmette Public Library while working on the book, and I was gratified to see that she even included the library in her acknowledgments. Catherine left the Midwest to study at Harvard and graduated in 2013 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. In 2014, she received her Master's of Philosophy degree in Modern European History from Christ College, University of Cambridge, where she wrote her dissertation on the origins of modern counterintelligence practices. After graduating, she worked in finance in New York City before a fortuitous visit to the bookstore in the lobby of her Manhattan office led her to the return to history and writing. She is currently pursuing her JD at Harvard Law School. The Daughters of Yalta is her first book. Those of you who have read the book will know that in it, Catherine deftly tells the story of the historic Yalta Conference when the leaders of the United States, United Kingdom, and Soviet Union met in February 1945 to discuss plans for Europe's post-World War II reorganization. Instead of focusing on the three allied leaders, however, Catherine's book focuses on the daughters of the three allied leaders who accompanied their respective fathers to the event. Kathleen Harriman, the 27-year-old daughter of W. Avril Harriman, American ambassador to the Soviet Union. Sarah Churchill, the 30-year-old daughter of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And 38-year-old Anna Roosevelt, daughter of the US President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Daughters of Yalta has been widely praised since it was published this fall and was named one of Publisher Weekly's best books of 2020, as well as the Telegraph's best history books of 2020. With that bit of background, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, author Catherine Grace Katz. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you to the entire Wilmette Public Library and to all of you who are tuning in this evening. It is truly just so special to be able to connect with folks you know, far and wide, but especially people close to home. I grew up in Winnetka and was a frequent visitor of the Winnetka Public Library. Very fond memories of attending the, the libraries that uh, mom and uh, parent-child uh, programs. Uh, I also love the, the summer reading program. I think I uh, would end up filling out three times the number of slots given on the sheet. That's what an avid reader I was and still am. Uh, but the Wilmette Library absolutely was a fixture in my you know, ability to do research for this book. They have a fantastic collection and such kind people. Uh, and thank you so much to, to the Wilmette Public Library for allowing me to extend checkout after checkout. I think I had a couple books out for about a year and a half. Uh, so thank you for not making me take my sticky notes out to bring the book back and check it back <laughs> again. Uh, and I also, you know, love the, the little store uh, on the, the ground level of the library. It just has so many great gems. I found incredible resources. So a huge thanks to the Wilmette, Winneka, and Glencoe Public Libraries for just wonderful support and the, the whole community. 
I you know, wish we could all gather together in person. Uh, Zoom has made it possible for people far and wide to join together, which is just wonderful. But there really is nothing like being able to, to gather, you know, even virtually with the local community. And I'm really so grateful for all the support, uh, you know, right you know, close to home. So thank you very much. I thought I would start this evening by showing a couple of photographs uh, just to set the scene. Um, some of you may have read the book, others haven't. So I'll try not to spoil too much for those who haven't. Um, would it be possible to make me a host so I could share the screen quickly? Um, sorry, I just wanna make sure I can do that. Perfect, thank you. So I'd love to start with this photograph of the, the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. Uh, this picture was taken uh, in the courtyard of Lavadia Palace during the Yalta Conference, and it is one of the most iconic and memorable images of World War II. Uh, it's also you know, one of the few pictures that we have of three allied leaders together. And this is a picture that often features in history textbook. It's in high school or in college where you think of kind of the end of the war. And this is one of the, the iconic images associated with it. And there's so much about this photograph that's very telling as you look at the, the faces of these three leaders and their military advisors behind them. And you can see it just looks like they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. Part of the reason for this is the fact that they've been at war for half a decade. Uh, but more immediately, it's because of what they've come to discuss at Yalta. The Yalta conference featured many issues uh, up for debate and negotiation as the war was drawing to a close. Just to mark where we are, uh, in February 1945, the Battle of the Bulge had just ended. It looks like finally the war in Europe will come to an end sometime in the spring or summer. The race is now on to see which allied army will be the first to liberate Berlin. The situation in the Pacific is not quite as advanced yet, uh, they, they don't yet know if the Manhattan Project will be a success, if the atomic bomb will be an option. And uh, Iwo Jima has not yet occurred. That takes place shortly after the Yalta Conference. So that's where we stand in the war when they all gather together to meet in February 1945. Some of the issues that are most important to them uh, start with uh, what to do in the immediate aftermath of the war as peace is being secured in Europe. And uh, fundamentals of this is what to do about Germany. What is Germany's future? Will they be allowed to remain one nation or should they be broken up into a group of smaller states in hopes that breaking them up will mean that they can't rise up as a belligerent for a third time in a century? Also extremely important, especially to Winston Churchill, is the matter of Polish sovereignty. Britain went to war in defense of Polish sovereignty at the outset. The Polish government has been in exile in London since the beginning of the war. And Churchill wants to make sure that when this is all over, that that which they went to war to secure uh, is indeed secured in the end. Stalin, however, has some other ideas. Dating back to the Tsarist era, uh, the, the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire before, they've been uh, invaded multiple times throughout the, the flatlands of Poland. And so Stalin is paranoid about security on his borders and securing, as he calls it, friendly neighbors. It's very important to him that he is able to be compensated for the sacrifices that the Soviet Union has made throughout the, the war. Uh, and he also has boots on the ground across, the, so, uh, across Eastern Europe to really back up what he, uh, he believes should rightfully be his, or at least in his sphere of influence. So he's not as willing as Churchill to make sure that the, the Polish government is quite as free as Churchill would like it to be. For Roosevelt, his attention is a little bit more directed towards the Pacific. Um, he is looking at bringing the war to the Pacific, in the Pacific to a close with as uh, few American casualties as possible. As I mentioned, he doesn't yet know if the atomic bomb will be a success. So he wants to try to bring the Soviet Union into the war to bring it to a quicker conclusion. The Soviets and the Japanese have had a pact of neutrality since the beginning of the war. And he wants to, uh, to in exchange for territorial concessions, bring the Soviets in to join the fight three months after the war in Europe ends to try to save as many American lives as possible. And finally, for Roosevelt, there's also a personal objective. He really wants to succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed. He wants to make sure uh, that in, when the war is over, not you know, to, to guarantee that you can secure peace for eternity, because he knows this is not a, a, a possible <laughs> objective, but he really wants to make sure that at least in Europe, they can secure peace for 50 years. He also sees the United Nations organization as a way to bring the Soviet Union into the post-war community after the common enemy has been defeated. 
So these are some of the issues up for debate, all of which are incredibly complicated, requ require significant negotiation. And this is what they are is weighing on their shoulders at this time. I also think it's important to take a look at just what it took to get to Yalta. At this point in the war, Stalin recognizes that he holds more cards than do his allies. So if they want to meet with him, they are going to have to come to him. He is paranoid about leaving the, uh, the security apparatus he has in the Soviet Union. He will not come any farther west than the Crimean Peninsula. He claims it's because his doctors advise him that it's bad for his health. However, uh, he is... Uh, he says that uh, he, you know, if they want to come to, if they want to meet, they have to come all the way. Meanwhile, Roosevelt, he's actually dying of congestion heart failure. And so though Stalin has said he's too sick to travel, it's a bit ironic considering what Roosevelt is willing to undergo, even though Stalin does not yet know the truth about Roosevelt's health. So Churchill flies 1,300 miles first to Malta, where they rendezvous, uh, he rendezvous with Franklin Roosevelt, but tragically on the way, one of the planes carrying members of the British Foreign Office delegate uh, delegation goes down off the coast of Italy and several experts are killed. Meanwhile, Roosevelt is traveling uh, by making a week-long voyage across the Atlantic Ocean by a destroyer convoy and they're still sighting enemy U-boats, which is, you know, just goes to show how dangerous this journey really was. Once they rendezvous in Malta, which has led to the apocryphal Stalin quip, I said Yalta, not Malta. They fly for their almost 1,400 miles to the Crimea where they land on an airfield with, uh, with a runway that is dangerously short. And then they have to drive a further six hours over battle scarred roads, sometimes no more than 20 miles an hour until they finally arrive at Lavadia Palace. Lavadia Palace was once the home of Tsar Nicholas II and his family. This was their summer country retreat away from the pressures of court where they really did engage in things that you know, a family would do like play tennis or go swimming, uh, go for uh, horseback riding and uh, visit the local bazaar. But once the Russian Revolution uh, came and the Romanov family was murdered, the Soviets decided to nationalize this once grand palace and turned it into a rest home for favored Soviet workers. When the war came, the Nazis invaded the Crimea and they turned Lavadia Palace into their Crimean headquarters. But when the Soviets pushed them out, and only uh, a few months before the Yalta Conference, the Nazis stripped the palace of everything that they could carry the furniture, the art, the lamps, the dishes, even down to the doorknobs, which they could uh, melt down and use as scrap metal. So the Soviets have just three weeks from the time that the three allied delegations agree this is where they're going to meet to put together one of the most important conferences in the history of the world, really as the world is teetering as we know it now on the precipice between World War and Cold War. So what the Soviets do, uh, they throw, or they do what they do best and that's throw manpower at a situation. So they take the contents of uh, glamorous hotels in Moscow, such as the Hotel Metropole, which some of you might be familiar with if you read Amber Toll's wonderful book, uh, A Gentleman in Moscow, and we're lucky enough to hear him come and speak uh, with the Wilmette Public Library about a year and a half ago. Um, and so they take the contents of the hotels and they put it on trains and transport it a thousand miles south. They frantically restock the villa with everything that they need, but still they're missing things like coat hangers and ashtrays, and they just requisition these items out of the homes of regular people who live in the area, people whose lives have been pretty much destroyed by the war. So though it looks like this beautiful uh, you know, setting on the Black Sea, this elegance of a time gone by, it really is a facade masking what lies beneath the surface. The other, reason, the other reason I like to start with this photograph is because it is uh, very revealing when juxtaposed against another photograph. You know, we think of this as kind of the iconic image. This is what we think of when we think of Yalta. But there's actually another photograph that was taken of the exact same scene, just a few moments apart, and you can see a slightly different perspective. Off to the side, you can see two young women. These young women are Sarah Churchill and Kathleen Harriman. Uh, just out of the frame is Anna Roosevelt, but you can see her on newsreel footage of the same scene. And I had never seen this photograph before I began investigating this story. This is, you know, it just goes to show just a slight change of perspective reveals details that have been hidden for 75 years. And this picture really made me start to think of all the people that these leaders, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Ambassador April Harriman could have brought with them to serve as their aides at the Yalta Conference. What was it that was so special about their daughter's skills, abilities, experiences that made them the perfect person to accompany them to the conference? And then on the other side, I began to think, you, we consider these world leaders and we think of them, you know, we put them on a pedestal to the point where they become almost larger than life, you know, you know, more than human. And yet to somebody, they're just dad. And what would it be like for this person to be your father and to be sharing this experience, uh, relationship between fathers and daughters at this moment 
that is so crucial to world history. But before I uh, tell you a little bit more about these three incredible young women, I'll introduce you to someone else. This is me in third grade. <laughs> I think that this is probably a, a picture that you have a version of this if, if you uh, have children that grew up in the local school system that is very familiar to you. This is uh, the chance that we had uh, as third graders to, to, to go and uh, have a pioneer school day, really get to put ourselves in the shoes of people who came before us, students in our exact same position. Uh, for those of us in Winneka and I think in Wilmette as well, we also got to do the pioneer room where we lived like pioneers for a day. And it was this immersive experience in history that really stayed with me. I had always loved history. I grew up loving movies like The Sound of Music and White Christmas and The Great Escape, uh, these great stories from World War II. My mom was always reading to us. We read books before bed every night on the porch in the summer, things like Anne of Green Gables and Little House on the Prairie. I also used to chase my grandfather around with a notepad asking him to tell me his stories about being in the Navy during World War II. And so, you know, this combination of, you know, the books and the movies and the family history, as well as the opportunities to immerse myself in the past, was something that really moved me and has stayed with me uh, all the way till now. I think it came as a surprise to no one that when I went to college, uh, I went out to Harvard and became a history major. Of course, I was going to be a history major. How could I not after the uh, little pioneer experience? Uh, and while I was working on my thesis, I unexpectedly spent a lot of time studying Winston Churchill. I was writing my thesis about British prisoner of war escape narratives and their place in British culture. And you can see uh, in this picture, this is me the morning that I turned in my thesis, looking a little worse for wear. Uh, and I'm in, uh, behind the 125 books I had checked out from the library. Uh, my roommate thought this was hilarious, and so she stacked them up and took a picture. But what I didn't realize when I started writing my thesis was that Winston Churchill had written kind of the first of what we think of as these escape narratives. And he had escaped from a Boer POW camp when he was there as a, a war correspondent at just 24 years old. And this tale of his thrilling escape rocketed him to fame in England and launched his political career. I then uh, had the great fortune of being able to fulfill a dream that I'd had since I was about five years old and that was going to study in England. Uh, so I had to, I uh, moved to Cambridge uh, where I was doing my master's in modern European history. And for someone who loves history, there really is no better environment into which you can you know, immerse yourself because everywhere you turn, history is all around you. Once again, uh, I found myself unexpectedly spending a lot of time with Winston Churchill. I was looking at the origins of modern counterintelligence practices, specifically an initiative in Britain during World War I, where they began to systematically read the inbound and outbound mail, trying to find enemy spies who might be in their midst. Winston Churchill had been very influential in this endeavor as well uh, when he was the Home Secretary during the First World War. So I had this wonderful year in the pastoral idyllic Cambridge. It ended all too soon. And then I did what many recent graduates do. Uh, that's the, they think is, is the smart thing to do. And I went to New York to work in finance, uh, trading in the lovely pastoral Cambridge for the hustle and bustle and hawks uh, of the horns <laughs> in New York City. But much to my surprise, uh, fate seemed to step in once again because in the lobby of my office was a bookstore. This uh, bookstore was called Chartwell Booksellers, which is named after Winston Churchill's country home, and it specializes in books by and about Churchill. It's kind of one of these things that, you know, all these, all these uh, idiosyncrasies that can only exist in, in New York City, I suppose. Uh, but I found myself on afternoons when I just needed a break from the Excel modeling. I just you know, couldn't take it anymore. I'd go down to the lobby, say I was getting a coffee, but really I would be wandering into the bookstore. Over time, I got to know the owner quite well, and he offered to introduce me to the International Churchill Society, which was a group of scholars and academics, but also professionals of all other areas uh, uh, of ex expertise, but, you know, united in their desire to want to encourage people to study history and international relations and pursue careers in public service inspired by the career of Winston Churchill. Uh, it turned out that they were having a dinner uh, at the Waldorf Hotel across the street from my office uh, featuring Madeleine Albright as their keynote speaker. I was very excited about this and I said, you know, I would love to go. So the owner connected me with the, the director of the Churchill Society and he said, yes, please come. We'd love to have you know, enthusiastic young people who like history. Uh, please come on over. So I had the chance to go. And while I was there, I was so fortunate to meet not only members of the society, but also members of the Churchill family. Uh, it was shortly thereafter that I learned that the Churchill family was opening the papers of Winston Churchill's middle daughter, Sarah, to outside researchers for the first time. 
They asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about them uh, for their magazine. I said, yes, I would love to do this, partly because I just saw it as a way to uh, stay engaged with history. I knew that finance probably wasn't what I wanted to do long term. I thought I would apply to law school. Uh, and I'd always wanted to be a writer, much like some of the characters in my favorite stories, like Little House on the Prairie and Anne of Green Gables. But I thought this would be something you know, I wouldn't do for many years, you know, maybe as a second career. And so you know, I thought this would just be a great way to stay involved, get to go back to Cambridge, see Sarah's papers. Uh, but there was also another reason that I was really excited about this. And this was because I had had this earlier life experience of sorts uh, with Sarah Churchill. My family goes to the cloister at Sea Island, Georgia every summer. Uh, we've gone every summer since I was a baby. And on the wall in the lobby of the cloister is this lovely picture of Sarah Churchill on her wedding day in 1949. She had eloped to Sea Island with her second husband, Anthony Beecham. And I had walked past this picture of her every day that I was there since before I could remember. And now here I was having the chance to read her letters and learn about her life. If people know about Sarah Churchill today, it's often that she was an actress and a dancer. She even starred in a movie uh, with uh, Fred Astaire in 1951 called Royal Wedding. But people don't usually know too much about her otherwise. But as I began to read her letters, I became fascinated, not with her career as an actress, which was uh, something very exciting and interesting, especially when women of her class and era had so few uh, professional opportunities. But I was really amazed by what she had done during the war. Sarah Churchill and her father always had a very close relationship. She said that she could understand the way that his mind worked and walk in silent step with him, you know, following along with what he was thinking, even if he wasn't saying it. And this came about largely because that they had shared long hours together in the garden at their home, Chartwell, uh, while Winston was engaged in one of his favorite pastimes, and this was bricklaying. This is something that he would do to relax, and Sarah would be out there with him as his helper, and they just passed these hours in contemplative harmony together. Like her father, she was fiercely independent, wanted to make a name for herself in the world. And in a different time, I do believe she could have been her father's political successor because she had an astute grasp of politics, a gift with language, much like Winston. She was a beautiful writer, uh, but she made, made her way as an actress, uh, really uh, bucking the trend. But she set aside the career that she had fought so hard for when the war broke out in order to do her bit. Sarah decided to join the women's branch of the Royal Air Force, and she served as an aerial reconnaissance intelligence officer, where she would look at photographs that had been taken thousands of feet in the sky by recon pilots and make intelligence assessments uh, in support of allied operations, specifically in the Mediterranean. So what she would do is she'd look at you know, a picture of a, the uh, enemy's harbor and try to determine what types of ships were there based on the kinds of shadows that they cast or looking at fields where grass had been trampled and trying to determine if it was an enemy troop movement or if it was just some cows that had grazed and moved on. Sarah also, uh, as I mentioned, was a great writer and her experience as an actress lent itself very well to diplomacy because diplomacy is very much about acting. Uh, and early in the war, Winston and Clementine Churchill had decided that when he traveled abroad for his meetings uh, with the other allied leaders, that someone from the family should go with him, in part to be his protector and confidant of sorts, but also because they knew that he wanted to write his wartime memoirs when it was all over, and they wanted someone from the family with him to record things that were taking place outside of the official meetings. Clementine Churchill uh, hated flying, and so she <laughs> did not want to have this job. But Sarah was actually the ideal choice. She had the expertise of having served in the military and understanding military operations. She was a terrific writer, understood politics, this combination of you know, actors acting you know, as it fits with diplomacy. And she just really, you know, again, understood the way that her father's mind worked. So in 1943, she had the first opportunity to go with her father to the Tehran Conference, the first meeting of the big three, where they were uh, determining the plans for the Normandy invasions. And while she was at this conference with her father serving as his aide, two other people took notice of how valuable she was. Uh, these people were Franklin Roosevelt and Ambassador April Harriman. People today often uh, forget about April Harriman, uh, but he was one of the most influential people in the 20th century and continued to be you know, from the early days as his uh, time as a businessman through World War II and well through the Cold War. April Harriman, at the time of uh, the Second World War, was one of the wealthiest men in America. He was the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad. He owned uh, Newsweek magazine. He had founded Brown Brothers Harriman. 
he had also founded Sun Valley, a glamorous ski resort, with the first of its kind in the United States, which is something that he had created in order to encourage people to use his trains and take them out west. Avril Harriman had two daughters, Mary and Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen was the younger daughter, and she did not have an especially close relationship with her father when she was a little girl. Avril Harriman was not a warm and fuzzy type by any means. He's often you know, away pursuing business opportunities, uh, but her parents had, uh, Kathleen's parents divorced when she was just 10 years old. And it wasn't until her mother passed away when Kathleen was a teenager that she began to develop a bond with her father, really united in their shared love of sport and adventure. Like her father, who was a polo champion, Kathleen was a terrific athlete. She was an Olympic level skier, an expert equestrian and a crack shot. And during her college vacations, she would go out to Sun Valley to assist her father. Avril Harriman, while not warm and fuzzy, was very ahead of his time compared to many fathers of his era. And he really encouraged his daughters to take part in his work to the extent that it interested them. And so Kathleen took him up on this offer and uh, spent her uh, college vacations working with him uh, in Sun Valley, where she spent time along, you know, hobnobbing with celebrities like Ernest Hemingway but also working in public relations and doing some intelligence gathering on nearby resorts that were popping up and really you know, helping him in every, in every way that you can imagine. This really became the foundation for what would become a real partnership uh, during World War II. Harriman had left uh, much of his business career uh, to the side during the Great Depression when he decided to join the New Deal administration, largely at the urging of his older sister, Mary Harriman Rumsey, who along with Frances Perkins was one of the most important women in the New Deal. But when war broke out and the United States was still neutral, FDR created the Lend-Lease program and he wanted someone in London to oversee it. Harry Hopkins had become very good friends with April Harriman and he recommended Harriman for the job. Harriman went over to London in uh, early 1941, and he decided this would be a great opportunity for his daughter. Now, at just 23 years old, she should come with him to London in the middle of the Blitz and work as a war reporter. So off Kathleen went to join her father on this adventure of a lifetime, where she and her father became very, very close friends with the Churchill family. So close, in fact, that they were celebrating her 24th birthday, the night that they all learned the news about Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Avril and Kathleen Harriman were especially close friends with uh, Winston Churchill's daughter-in-law, Pamela. Uh, Kate, she was two years younger than Kathleen, uh, but Kathleen quickly realized that not only was Pamela her best friend, but she was also having an affair with her father. In 1943, FDR appointed F uh, Avril Harriman the ambassador to the Soviet Union. Kathleen decided to go with him and continue this adventure where she learned to speak Russian for both of them. And she really became in many ways the American woman that had more access to and experience with Stalin in his inner circle than any other American woman in history. This picture that you see, Kathleen is standing with a horse that was gifted to her by Stalin in recognition of the part that she had played in the war. And at Yalta, she was really the perfect person to assist her father, really working as uh, what we think of like a protocol officer at the State Department today, serving as a liaison between the Soviets and Americans, overseeing all the logistics that were very complicated for this conference. Uh, and really was the first step towards successful diplomacy. And in doing so, she was also able to expand her father's reach and influence. The last of the three daughters is Anna Roosevelt. Anna was the oldest of the three daughters at 38. She was also the only mother. She had three children uh, at this point. And she and her father had had a very close relationship when she was a little girl. You can see this picture of the two of them together at Campobello Island, and it's you know unusual today to see pictures of Roosevelt standing. But she and uh, FDR were very close, and really united in this shared love of the natural world. They had a passion for the environment, and would go and ride horses around their land in the Hudson River Valley. He would teach her about nature, and someday she dreamed that they would become the co-custodians of sorts uh, of their home in Hyde Park but his polio diagnosis and paralysis changed all this. Anna soon found herself on the outside looking in, always at an arm's length. She was uh, removed from him by you know, these doctors and nurses who were always on hand, his political colleagues who now needed to come to him. And so Anna found herself you know, pushed away, sent off to school. Uh, she then had to become a debutante, which she hated. And uh, she spent a, a little bit of time at Cornell but left at age 20 to make a rebellious marriage, which sadly didn't last. Uh, but she soon fell in love again, uh, somewhat controversially, <laughs> with a Republican journalist named John Bodiger, who was working for one of Hearst, uh, William Randolph Hearst's papers. And Hearst was a, a big critic of FDR, so you think, you know, crossing the political divide. 
uh, and kind of think of, you know, what if that happened today? And so uh, Anna and John married and they moved out to Seattle where they became the editors of one of Hearst's papers, the Seattle Post Intelligencer. In 1943, John joined the army. And so Anna decided rather than stay in Seattle, she, would want, she wanted to return home to her family. And that meant moving home to the White House. Anna arrived at Christmas time, 1943. And soon after arriving, she noticed that something wasn't quite right about her father. It was hard to put her finger on it, but it was you know, small things that he wasn't uh, grasping details as well as he once had. That he would sit with his mouth hanging open for long periods of time, almost as if he couldn't get enough oxygen. Anna was very concerned, but nobody else seemed to notice. Her mother, Eleanor, couldn't really tell that anything was wrong. And perhaps it was because Anna hadn't seen him for quite a while. And it was the difference in how she remembered him to how he seemed now. In the spring of 1944, she insisted that he have a comprehensive medical examination. This revealed that he was in fact dying of congestive heart failure. Anna and the cardiologist were sworn to secrecy. They could not tell anyone about his diagnosis. And curiously, Roosevelt himself never once asked what was wrong with him. You can imagine, you know, as a wartime president, you're trying to do everything you can to, to win the war and any other distractions or something that you just can't take at that time. And the knowledge that you may be dying, even if you suspected to have it confirmed, may have just been too much for him. But clearly he recognized that Anna was doing something, protecting him from something. She was uh, changing his diet, making sure that he was eating healthier foods, getting as much rest and relaxation as a wartime president possibly could. She became the White House gatekeeper in many ways, helping to determine who needed to have an, an audience with him and who could meet with someone else. Sometimes even going so far as to take papers out of his inbox at night and distributing them to others who she felt could handle them. And though he didn't know what was wrong, he could sense that Anna was doing something to protect him because in 19, uh, January 1945, he cabled Winston Churchill and said, if you're thinking of bringing your daughter Sarah to the Yalta conference, I'm thinking of bringing my daughter Anna. For Anna, this was really the fulfillment of a lifelong dream, certainly one that had solidified in recent years. When Roosevelt traveled abroad during the war, he'd always turned to one of his sons to help him, especially physically, to, to stand and move. Anna was the oldest daughter and uh, oldest child and only daughter of the Roosevelt's uh, five children. And she long wanted an opportunity to travel with him the way that her four younger brothers had, to try to recapture this closeness of, uh, with him that she remembered from when she was a little girl. And so finally, that January, she got her wish. She got to go with her father to one of the most important meetings of the century. But for her, it was much more personal because she knew that this may be her last chance to be with him in this way, to be indispensable to him in the way that she knew that she could. So Anna goes to Yalta knowing that this very well may be the last time. And all the while she's there, she's keeping this deadly secret that he's dying and can't tell anyone uh, what's wrong. This is a photograph of the three daughters together at Yalta. And uh, one of the reasons I love this picture is because uh, of their, their very stylish coats. They look so elegant. You can see Sarah in her officer's coat, uh, overcoat, Anna in her, her tweed, and Kathleen in a lovely fur coat. Um, but it was also a, a fun kind of connection because Harry Hopkins had also brought his son, Robert, who was serving as the official American photographer at the conference, and he's the one who took this picture. And so you can see it's kind of this moment of connecting of the second generation of the wartime leaders. But this picture also really uh, makes me think about the, the role that these daughters were playing. And the way that I think of them at the Yalta conference is that they were serving the role of daughter diplomats where they weren't official members of the delegation speaking for the government in the way someone might from the State Department or the British Foreign Office, but they spoke with the weight of their fathers behind them. So they could go places and deliver subtle nuanced messages that others might not be able to do or gather information and bring it back to their fathers. They also had the opportunity to go out into the local community and meet people from Yalta and the nearby port city of Sevastopol and see how their lives had been affected by the war, how they were different from the senior members of the Soviet delegation, including Stalin himself, uh, all the people that they were meeting and interacting with at Lavadia Palace. But also they were able to you know, come back and tell their fathers at the end of the day of what they had seen, you know, as their fathers were literally reordering the lives of the people that they were meeting out uh, in the surrounding towns. So it's this very powerful role that they play, you know, the link between their, their fathers and uh, the other individuals with whom they're negotiating and you know, regular people as well. And they're also almost an embodiment of the, the next generation you know, for whom the war is being fought so that they can and their children can go and live in you know, peace and prosperity. I also love to think about what the experience of the three daughters together at Yalta can inform about our world today. 
I think history means different things to us in different times. And it's one of the reasons that it's most important to go back and still tell the stories, even when you think they've been told a hundred times over. I think there are you know, over a thousand biographies written about Winston Churchill, but it's still worth going back and reading his words and you know, original writings and hearing you know, the observations of people on the ground because they really do stand out to us in different ways, echoing different problems that are facing us today. Through the experience of the daughters of Yalta, one of the things that emerges to me, with, uh, to me today is thinking about the relationship between Russia and the West. At Yalta, Franklin Roosevelt was determined to build a personal bond with Stalin, much like he had had since the beginning of the war with Winston Churchill. And it was that friendship that really was the bedrock of the special relationship. He thinks he can do the same with Stalin, but unfortunately, in dealing with the Soviet leader, it's just not quite the same. I do believe that Stalin really admired Franklin Roosevelt and respected him, but that admiration, respect, and even friendship wasn't going to change the way that he approached foreign policy. You've seen successive American uh, presidents try to build that bond and uh, that personal bridge with the, the Soviet and then Russian leader, saw it as recently as the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations. And unfortunately, you know, we're 76 years away from Yalta now, and that trying to build a personal bond just really has never been a winning strategy in all that time. And so now, you know, at the beginning of the new administration, how can we learn those lessons and find mutual areas of cooperation with Russia, if not determined by that link between the leaders on a person-to-person -person basis? I also think about, you know, the questions that we have now about what are the, is the appropriate role for the unelected family members and an elected official to play in their public duties? Uh, to some extent, it's like when you marry someone, you marry their family. When you elect someone, you sort of elect their family in a way. And we have all agreed that there should be some role for the first spouse. But what about adult first children? Should they have a role? Should they be part of an you know, official administration? We've had uh, children, especially for sons, serving as principal private secretaries, dating back to the administration of John Quincy Adams. Uh, however, we haven't had first children as involved in policy in the way that they had been in the Trump administration. Uh, we saw Ivanka Trump taking meetings at the G20 herself, which is very different from what the daughters were doing at Yalta, where they didn't have the security clearance to be in the conference room or the policy expertise, um, but they were very important in other ways. And so what is the happy medium that we can strike between you know, the different examples of a first daughter's activity and what are we comfortable with as, uh, as voters? And finally, you know, I think that you know, while it's wonderful that we have the technology to all to speak with uh, each other together uh, this evening, I think that the desire that Roosevelt and Churchill had to meet with Stalin uh, in person is very important to think about as you know, we transition hopefully soon to a post-COVID world, because I do believe that in certain instances, uh, especially, it's vitally important to have person-to-person -person diplomacy, to have a delegation go and see what life is like in a country where you're trying to negotiate, to be able, especially in a place like Russia, where the, the facade is not necessarily indicative of reality, to be able to peek behind the curtain and really see what the life is like there. And to be able to come together in international organizations and institutions like the United Nations. It was so important for Roosevelt uh, to create this because he wanted to have a forum for people from all around the world to gather and dis discuss diplomacy together. And so I hope, you know, while Zoom is something that can be a tool, it doesn't necessarily have to replace in-person diplomacy. And I think that that's something that is a, a lesson from Yalta that is especially resonant today. And finally, I think with history, you know, there are difficult times that we've encountered, you know, much like this one in different ways that resonate over time. And I do believe that as we look back at history, we can see that we've overcome these challenges and we can rise to the occasion. And so history can be a source of inspiration and solace in even the most difficult times. Uh, so I think I'll stop uh, sharing my screen there and would love to uh, take some questions uh, if you have some, which it looks like from the chat, there are many. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of this with us. I'm Amy Barrow. And I'm Barbara Goodman. And we're going to move on now to the question and answer part of the program. So please remember that you can ask a question by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen that looks like two um, text boxes put together. And we will get to as many of the questions as we can. So let me go ahead and start. Um, let's see here.
How did you manage to transition to writing a book of, um, from what you were doing in your previous career, which was finance? And any advice for somebody trying to chase that dream? <laughs> I think, yeah, sometimes you look at my resume, people aren't sure how it all fits together. I did study both history and economics as a, an undergraduate and had uh, interned in college at Goldman Sachs and then uh, would have gone back if not for Cambridge. It's something that I, I really wanted to do. Goldman couldn't understand why. I was like, no, I have to do this. Um, and I'm so glad that I did. Um, I think that I, you know, I, if not for the time spent in finance, I never would have had the opportunity to write this book. It really was so many of those fortuitous circumstances that came together, you know, through the bookstore in the lobby of my office. Um, but I also think that, you know, it, you know, understanding business and being involved in it, even for a short amount of time, it kind of allows you to have a different perspective on the kinds of history that you're writing. And also, you know, writing is, uh, is creative, but it's a business like many others. And to understand the business side of publishing and um, kind of just the, you, you want to, of course, be creative, um, but you also want to be able to understand, you know, the way that people interact and that is often, you know, in a business to business way uh, and with people all around the world. I've been really lucky to have the book also uh, now be published in, in Dutch in the Netherlands and forthcoming editions in places like Poland and South Korea and Romania. And so just, you know, having the chance to even, you know, have a little experience working in an international related business environment is even really helpful on that front too. Um, so, but I think that, you know, history was always my first love. I always wanted to be a writer since I was a little girl. I didn't think it was something I could do until I was, you know, much older, maybe when I had children. Um, but I'm just really grateful that the stars aligned that I was able to do this now. And I knew that if I didn't do it, it would have, you know, I would have re regretted it. <laughs> and so I'm really, really glad that I did. And uh, it was a risk to take, but one that I has certainly, you know, paid off in, you know, so many ways and has been so personally fulfilling. That's great. So this question, I believe, comes from uh, an audience member who listened to your book. And we know that a lot of people, a lot of patrons did listen to the audio versions and, um, instead of reading the book. As an author, how much input you have in choosing the audiobook reader? <laughs> That's a fun question. Um, so I got to listen to the auditions of several actresses to what, uh, you know, were candidates to read the book, uh, some British, some American, and after listening to uh, various audition tapes, uh, I was able to choose the voice that I thought matched the tone of the story. Um, and I also think, you know, it is kind of as, you know, two thirds of the characters are American, a third of you know, the characters are British, but in many ways it had kind of the, the feelings of a very British sort of story. And I think that, that um, and British voices also kind of lend themselves so well to international stories. We see often that is kind of, you know, a role, you know, in Hollywood um, where it is kind of that more ambiguous international kind of feeling. And so that was uh, a really fun part of this and not something that I thought about uh, getting to do at the beginning, but you know, the, uh, it really is, is a fascinating business in so many ways. That's great. Um, so there was a new chair faculty member who remembers you so fondly and um, her book is reading the book, your book this year. What was the most impactful book you read maybe in high school? And oh, I don't gosh. know if you wanna add one in college too, but. Yeah, um, so I, I see in the Q and A that question came from uh, Carrie Hall, my, my freshman history teacher. <laughs> nice to see you. Or you know, you know, get your question. I wish I could see you. Um, the most impactful book I read in high school, I think, was Young Men in Fire by Norman McLean, which we read for AP Junior English, and it was a, a fascinating and harrowing story, and you know, tragic in so many ways. But it was told from just such a unique perspective, you know, kind of the, the environment and the interactions of humans in their environment. And I think that the sense of place at Yalta was something that stood out really clearly to me and the way that environment impacts history. And I think that having the chance to see something like that through the work of, you know, a beautiful writer like Norman McLean at, you know, New Trier, is a, <laughs> not a walk in the park, especially when you're taking four level and AP classes, but you really are exposed to so many incredible works and you have the chance to expand your mind well beyond you think you might be able to kind of as, as a high school student. And that's uh, one that absolutely stands out to me from my time at Nutria, which I continue to recommend to people all the time. 
Do you feel one has to travel to places near and far in order to get the information needed for writing books like yours? Or can a writer do so entirely from where they live? That's a great question. And it's one that is uh, a little tricky to answer in some ways. So I was really fortunate to be able to go places like Chartwell, the church's home in England and the Harriman's home uh, in Harriman, uh, New, Mar New York, Arden House uh, and uh, Hyde Park, you know, Spring Springwood, uh, the Roosevelt's home. And you know, in these cases, uh, fam the family members also made it possible for me to see things that I wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. And I'm so grateful for the support of all of the families in this project. So getting to see the places that these three young women grew up and the worlds that they came from and being able to, to walk through the, the homes and the, you know, the, the, uh, the gardens where they spent so many formative years, that was really important. I did not, however, get to go to Yalta. I started researching this book after the hostilities in the Crimea broke out. That started happening in 2014 when I was still working at BlackRock. And uh, I did look into going to Yalta that was advised against it by the State Department, British Foreign Office, it just you know, as an American who was not a Russian speaker and is very obviously American, that wouldn't have been a, a smart idea, especially as you can't go in through Ukraine anymore, you have to go through Russia. So I did not get to do that. Um, I think it is important to see as much as you can on the ground, but it also evolves a lot over time. It doesn't look the same way now as it did in 1945. But I'm really lucky that we had great resources like newsreel footage, uh, photographs. I was able to connect with the granddaughter of the official Soviet photographer who allowed me to see photos that I had never seen before, including a few that appear in the book, which is bringing you know, another set of eyes, a different perspective on these scenes that we think we know so well, but really we're only seeing part of the story. So I, you know, in a case like not being able to <laughs> travel to a place that's very dangerous now, uh, having these resources that do show such a, a well-rounded glimpse of what life would have been like at that moment in time that was invaluable. Great. Um, after Yalta, when opinion varied, whether the conference was a success or not, do you think the three daughters had a strong view and did their view change as time went on about what had happened? I think that like so many members of the delegations that went there from the United States and from Britain, you know, from the, the highest ranks to the lowest, I think there was a real desire to try to be optimistic about what had taken place and what, had, what agreements had been reached. Um, I'll use the example of Kathleen Harriman. She had, as a, as a war reporter in London, she had a, a very skeptical view of Stalin from a very early time. Um, she was significantly more skeptical of Stalin and his intentions than was her father at the beginning. He had done business in the Soviet Union in the 20s. He thought, you know, you can do business with people anywhere. This, you know, an alliance with them is going to be like that. But Kathleen was covering the press conferences with the exiled leaders from Europe, especially from Poland, and they were really warning early on Stalin is not who you think he is. And so it was you know, not until Kathleen and her father went to Moscow that April Herrmann was really able to see firsthand what doing business with the, the, the Soviet leadership would be like through the uh, formative experience of the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, which was just a, was catastrophically devastating to the Polish resistance uh, and really kind of in a way that the, the Soviets really set them up to fail um, you, there's a, a part about that in the book that I hope you'll read and just you know, remember the courage of the, the people who have taken part in that uprising. And so I think you know, by the time the Yalta conference comes, Kathleen really wants to believe that it's gonna be a success. And so she walks away from the conference sounding optimistic, trying to make herself believe that they had really uh, been able to form a strong bond and workable uh, negotiations with the Soviets. But she very quickly in the weeks after realizes that this was her kind of trying to be optimistic about things that she knew from her prior experience really wasn't the case. And I think that, that um, return to reality occurs very, very quickly for her in Moscow, even faster than it does, uh, especially for the Americans. Churchill, I think sometimes is seen as maybe having had too friendly a view of Stalin. There's a, that famous quote, if I, only I could dine with Stalin once a week, there'd be no trouble. 
Um, I think that the way that he kind of signals uh, the kind of outwardly, his feelings about Stalin are very different than how he feels personally. And you can see more of those deep concerns that he has especially at the end of Yalta when he and his daughter are leaving and he confesses to her how much trepidation he has about the future. And uh, which is then different from how he sounds you know, very optimistic when he goes uh, to report to parliament. Uh, but then you know, that same week is writing a letter to the, the uh, New Zealand prime minister about how concerned he is about Stalin keeping his word, especially in Poland. You know, so I think there is a, a real desire to try to believe in what happened, you know, including by the daughters, but I think that especially in the case of Sarah Churchill and Kathleen Harriman, who had really been on the ground uh, in London and then in Moscow, that there was uh, a quicker um, return to reality after the euphoria of, you know, a seemingly triumphant end to the Yalta Conference. So one of our uh, viewers wants to know if the three daughters left memoirs of their time at Yalta that you were able to read, and maybe you can expand upon that. I mean, I know you, you have an enormous bibliography. So <laughs> I don't think you can sum up what types of sources you used, but maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit about your source material and how you, how you gathered what you did. Sure. Um, well, I love the research part of this. It truly is like a treasure hunt and putting all the pieces together is the, the most fun part of the whole thing. <laughs> yes, there, there are about 100 pages of notes in the back of the book. Um, you don't have to read all of them if you don't want to, but sometimes they're a little fun asides that I wasn't able to get into the main body of the work that are in the end notes. Um, I also get the question sometimes, you know, how much of this did you make up? How much you know, is this historical fiction? And uh, the answer is none of it. I didn't make any of it up. If somebody said the wind was blowing from the east, that's not just me adding color. It was literally because somebody reported that the wind was blowing from the east that day. Um, the daughters did leave uh, writings and letters and uh, memories of Yalta. Uh, as I mentioned, I was the first person to be able to go through Sarah Churchill's papers comprehensively, and she wrote extensively to her mother during the time that she was at Yalta. And her letters are just so lyrical and eloquent and she really emerged to me as the conscience of the conference in, the, in her words to her mother. Um, so you know for her she did um, transcribe some of those letters and include them in later writing. She did write two memoirs, uh, one that was really kind of a dedication to her father and another about her own life experiences. So pieces of the letters appear there but not nearly the, the wealth of beauty of the observations that she had you know in the original letters. So that was really special. Kathleen Harriman wrote many letters uh, from Yalta uh, to her sister and to her former governess, uh, and especially to her best friend, Pamela Churchill. <laughs> um, she, uh, her relationship and friendship with Pamela is really interesting. Uh, and that's one that maybe some people already know about. Uh, her father had been having an affair with Pamela when they were living in London, he broke it off. He actually asked Kathleen to break it off for him when they moved to Moscow. Um, but Kathleen and Pamela stay very good friends. And so there are wonderful letters to Pamela from Kathleen. They're very uh, informative about what's happening. Uh, and then just as an aside, there were a couple of other people having affairs with Pamela Churchill who were at Yalta, including uh, Fred Anderson, uh, one of the American Army Air Corps uh, representatives and Peter Portal, the head of the RAF. Uh, and they were writing letters to kind of show off to Pamela and then they wanted to hand deliver them so they could see her. And the great thing that, about that is that they didn't have to go through the censor. So we have letters that have not been chopped up. We get the entirety of, the, of their observations because they were writing these love letters to Pamela. Um, so Kathleen's letters, um, there are a few that are in her father's archive in the Library of Congress, but most of them are just uh, held privately by the family as well as some of her scrapbooks from the war, which uh, her family only discovered after she passed away in 2011 because she was really very humble and didn't say much about her experience during the war. But through her private papers, you can just see you know, a young woman coming of age uh, in London and in Moscow on the forefront of history, which is remarkable. And then Anna Roosevelt's letters uh, and a small diary at uh, the presidential, the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park. But I was also really lucky to be kind of right at this inflection point between having new sources become available, like Sarah's papers, like Kathleen's papers, uh, her family making those available to me, um, but then also being able to interview people like Anna Roosevelt's daughter, uh, who is now in her 90s, but was a teenager at the time of Yalta, remembers it so clearly. Uh, and a son who was a little boy and was very sick while uh, his mother was away. And it was a really memorable um, series of weeks for him. So I was able to interview both of them and they were actually so kind to join in a Zoom that I did earlier this week uh, and share a few memories, which was just remarkable that they were able to do this you know, on opposite ends of the country, just 
God, living history. And I also had got to interview Lady Jane Williams, who was Churchill's secretary. And she uh, is also the mother of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so she's had a really fascinating view of this, you know, you know the 1940s to today, just incredible people. So the, the chance to see new papers, but also to talk to people who knew and loved these daughters more than anyone is just an incredible experience. Well, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions, but um, this is the cover of the book for, I'm sure most of you have seen it, but we do have a question about why the order of the picture was changed for the cover. And I, I don't know if you had input in that, but- <laughs> I do, yeah. Actually, ask, it's, it's did a you want to portray Kathy as the center of attention? Uh, no, actually it's a really much more just, you know, crazy reason than that. <laughs> it's just really <laughs> kind of silly. Um, so when we colorized the photo to use on the cover, the way Anna was holding her purse and her gloves, it kind of looks like she was holding a cat, which was okay. really strange. <laughs> and so we kind of, you know, cut each of them out of the picture kind of as their own figure and doing that and reordering it, it just kind of drew your eye away from what looked oddly like a cat for some reason. <laughs> and so that that's why the picture is the way it is. But you know, it's also kind of nice. I think these daughters are kind of they follow a gradient. Sarah really holding up the British side. Um, Kathleen having experience, you know, living in London, but being an American and then Anna being an American. So we'll think of it as a Venn diagram. So this uh, odd thing about, you know, <laughs> the way Anna's gloves looked uh, once, you know, put in color actually kind of worked out symbolically well. That's funny. <laughs> Catherine, can you tell us what's next for you? And also in terms of um, law school, how much law school you have left? And then if you know what you're next, what you're going to be working in next, if there's yes. going to be. Um, so <laughs> so uh, I'm really uh, so fortunate that the book has been optioned by Amy Pascal and Sony Features uh, for a, uh, a screen adaptation. Uh, so I'm very excited about that and uh, hope that we can get vaccines out quickly so we can get to work on that quickly. Um, so you know, really looking forward to that. And uh, I think she's just a, a terrific producer. She did Little Women and The Post and Spider-Man and just amazing. Um, so that that's one thing. I do have two more years of law school to finish. I finished writing this book during my first year of law school and I did take this year off to, to focus on the book tour. Uh, and so I will go back to Harvard Law in the fall. And I really wanna be able to use law and history in a complementary way. I you know, don't think history should exist in a vacuum just to you know, tell history, to tell this history for history's sake, but to use history as a tool that can inform complex issues that we face in the present. And I think often that those questions have a, a strong legal component and the history and law go hand in hand so nicely, especially on complex international related questions. And so I hope someday to be able to kind of bring those fields together. Um, I don't know if I'll, I'll practice law, you know, as a corporate lawyer, probably not. I think if I was going to do that, I would have stayed in finance, but I absolutely want to continue to write. And if someday I can uh, be an advisor uh, or a diplomat myself and kind of use the expertise of law and history together, that would be a, a wonderful dream kind of far off in the future. Um, but more immediately, I absolutely uh, want to write another book. <laughs> COVID's making things a little bit slower than I had hoped. It's kind of the irony of have all this time right now, but no archives are open, so I can't actually get any documents. I can't get to England to see any sources there. Um, but I am, I really love stories that are kind of a slice of time where you have fascinating people who wouldn't necessarily all be in the same scene together, kind of all coming together at this pivotal moment where you can see intersecting threads of history kind of passing through kind of often at these moments of uh, the change kind of, of world order. So I'm looking at uh, a particular episode from uh, before the war as German American relations are deteriorating um, and the uh, abdication crisis is brewing. Uh, so looking at uh, a story that kind of brings those three threads together in one uh, pivotal event. So that's what I'm thinking about writing, <laughs> but until I can actually get my hands on the sources, I can't make as much progress as I would like. Well, it sounds fascinating and I know your many readers that you've cultivated over the course of uh, this, this book and this experience are going to look forward to reading that when you're through with it and when it comes out, sounds great. Um, I think we're about out of time, but we wanna thank you once more for your time tonight. Uh, during the book discussions that Amy and I led for the library about Daughters of Yalta, 
many people commented on the high level of scholarship in your book. And I think it is crystal clear that you're equally as impressive when you speak as you are with the written word. So it was really a treat to have you with us. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you to all of you who have come tonight and please keep your eyes out for a follow-up email from the library about tonight's event. Just wanna remind you one more time about the library's 16th annual One Book Everyone Reads program, the Community Reads series that will take place this spring as Anthony mentioned earlier. This program, the program this year will feature Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. And the author will join us virtually to talk about the book on Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. So please mark your calendars and contact the library if you'd like to check out a copy and there will be more information forthcoming about other related events. With that, we wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening. Stay warm, stay safe, and good evening. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining this cool. evening.